is Pastor Taylor. Good evening and welcome to the Spring Hill broadcast. We're excited and delighted that we're all able to join in a worship together tonight. So no matter whether you're joining us from somewhere around the Gainesville region, somewhere else in the state of Florida, outside the state of Florida or somewhere else uh, in the world, we are excited that we're able to uh, share together in the Word of God. We have prayed for, planned for, and prepared for us this opportunity uh, to share in the Word of God. So do me this favor. Uh, would you please hit a thumbs up, uh, like, or sh and share from whatever platform you're on. And then also uh, you can look at us, maybe you're joining us from the Spring Hill website itself. Uh, that's springhillgnv.org. And uh, the watch uh, button is there or the watch uh, item is there in the menu bar of the Spring Hill website where you can see our broadcast as well. No matter what platform you're joining us from, please uh, put a comment in and say, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here, glad to be here. And just let us know that you are here, present and accounted for. And we thank God for the opportunity to share in the word of God together. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you for your grace, your love, your majesty and your might. We thank you, Father, for these things because they are so much greater than ours. And for those things, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We're praying now as we study the word. We thank you for your holy word. We pray that you open our minds and help us to understand and soften our hearts and help us to spiritually receive. And we will give you thanks, praise, honor, and glory unto the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are your servants praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is the day, that's what the Bible says, that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. No matter uh, what challenges uh, you face today and what uh, things that have come against you today, do know that it's still a good day because it is the day the Lord has made. God met us this morning with new mercies and new grace, and so we are grateful uh, for what he's done for us this day. Uh, I love the Lord Jesus and I love his word. Join me in his word in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number five, Ephesians chapter number five, uh, verses uh, 22 through 32 will be our uh, subject text tonight. Ephesians chapter five, verses 22 through 32 will be our subject lesson tonight. The word of God reads, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or anything like that, but holy and blameless, in the same way husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, for this reason man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Tonight's uh, lesson is about uh, the blessing of a marital union, the blessing of a marital union. Uh, on Sunday, we discussed uh, Jesus' teaching about marriage and divorce from Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 through 32, and then again from Matthew 19, verses 2 through 12. Those are two cornerstone scriptures in which our Lord Jesus teaches about the context and the priority of marriage, but also the uh, unfortunate circumstance of divorce. He reframes and refocuses the conversation from the current loose culture that he was living in uh, as it related to uh, marriage and divorce where people would uh, divorce for uh, trivial reasons and would divorce just based on not feeling like being married to that person anymore. Remember I referenced uh, how 
uh, Herod uh, married his brother's sister. She divorced his brother and he took on his brother's wife. Remember I referenced uh, Claudius and how he divorced his wife in order to marry his brother's daughter, to marry his niece, Agrippina, uh, and adopted her son, Nero, who would become the, the uh, Caesar of Rome and one of the worst Caesars that the empire had ever uh, seen. Uh, that story about Herod uh, and Philip, uh, Philip's wife ended in tragedy in the fact that John the Baptist called it out and said that that was wrong to do. And, uh, and he was beheaded because he told the truth. And so Jesus is preaching and teaching in that context. And he says, now listen, we need to have more serious uh, attitude and we need to have a more grave nature when it comes to marriage, that marriage is a deeper and, and more important commitment than how we're approaching it. Uh, and he says, uh, you know, that uh, there, there's very limited reasons why uh, we should divorce. And uh, one of the things I wanted you to take from the teaching on Sunday was this, that it is unfortunate that divorce does happen. Uh, that's just the reality that we live in. Uh, but do understand that God is not angry. God is not upset. He hates divorce, but he is not angry with those persons that get divorced who are in Christ. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Some things happen and uh, some things are just unavoidable. But if you've done all you can, if you have prayed, studied the scriptures and tried to bring uh, God in the center of the family home and things just have not worked out, then sometimes divorce does happen. But it is not something that we should uh, enter into loosely and without uh, any thought of the consequence because there is always uh, collateral damage that comes from that. There will always be some remnants of hurt and uh, some remnants of, of uh, the tragedy of two lives being, being separated, uh, or one life rather, uh, because we're one in Christ and then once, uh, and, and one in marriage, but then once that separation occurs, you're, you're literally splitting uh, flesh from flesh and, and person from person. And so we, we should think soberly about it. We ought to think very serious about it. We shouldn't have a casual attitude about it. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter number seven, we reference that there's another great place that talks about marital relations and talks about divorce, but specifically Paul uh, in a large chunk of that scripture is dealing with the uh, issue of those that are married and they are in an incompatible relationship as it relates to faith. Uh, and it's for the instance of these Gentiles are now coming into the faith, uh, husband gets saved, wife is not saved, and so now they are like two ships passing in the night when it comes to their spiritual directions uh, or vice versa. A wife gets saved, a husband is not saved, and they're, they're just not uh, uh, consisting well together. Paul cautions and says that a believing uh, spouse should not divorce a non-believing spouse in that instance, uh, but, but try to endure and try to work with and go along with that person, hoping that your life in Christ will bring along that unbeliever. Uh, always giving uh, grace and, and showing love because that's what God extends to us. And so again, he heightens and shows the importance of marriage and also uh, the fact that we should try to avoid divorce as much as we can. Tonight, we're looking at Ephesians chapter number five, which is Paul's uh, description of, of marriage and using it uh, as a picture of Christ's love with the church. Uh, in symbolic representation, and in it he gives us some good instruction. When you read the book of Ephesians, do note that it is written to a group of believers in the city of Ephesus, and Ephesus is one of the most liberal and immoral places uh, uh, on the earth at this time. It was a major trade route, and it was a place uh, that was presided over by the temple of the goddess Diana that sat high, 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 up on the mountain and the houses of Ephesus were fixed into the hillside and in the mountainside of uh, the, the area of Ephesus. And so uh, in these winding tight little streets uh, are homes fixed into the rocks of the mountains. And pretty much anywhere you are in the city of Ephesus, you look up and you see a temple 
that is erected to the goddess Diana, and she was a sensual goddess where they had uh, very uh, strange worship practices in this temple. And that's the kind of place that uh, people are trying to have a life and family together. And, uh, but that's the place where God's grace met many of them and many of them were saved. And so Paul uses his letter uh, to the believers in Ephesus to teach them about their faith and about the truth of God's word in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapters one through six, uh, he uses different metaphors to describe uh, the life of believers. In Ephesians chapter one, uh, he talks about the temple of God. In Ephesians chapter two, uh, we are uh, new creatures in God, or that's Ephesians chapter four. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, we are a, uh, a people that have been called by God into God's grace, and by grace are we saved. E Ephesians chapter three, he talks about a mystery. Ephesians chapter four, a new man. Ephesians chapter five, it's the bride of Christ. And Ephesians chapter six, uh, we are the army of God. Here in chapter five, he focuses on the bride of Christ, which is the church, showing that marital relationships give a picture on earth of Christ's love for the church and what we will enjoy in heaven. And here in Ephesians 5 verses 22 through 32, what he does is he teaches us how to look at our marital relationships based upon the relationship that Christ has with his church. Remember, uh, Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The church belongs to him and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Remember that in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul says, take heed, therefore, of yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Uh, the church belongs uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Ephesians chapter five, we see how this relationship is lived out on our earthly standpoint in our earthly marriages. And the first thing he shows us in verse 22 is that wives should submit themselves to their husbands or to the leadership of their husbands. Notice what it says in 522. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, meaning having reverential and having uh, committed uh, devotion to the leadership of your husband. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, meaning the husband gives leadership. He gives, uh, he, he gives direction uh, in the family and in the home, even as Christ is the head of the church, meaning Christ, uh, everything we do has to follow Christ's leadership and is under Christ's authority. Now, let me share with you about this word submit because it has become a taboo word. It's almost a curse word in our modern culture uh, with uh, the backdrop of feminist conflict theory in view. The word submission is not an ugly word, nor does it mean that uh, the one that submits is not capable, competent, and uh, clear thinking. But submission is actually a military term in the Greek and what it uh, suggests in the Greek is a battalion of soldiers that come into alignment and come under the direction and leadership and authority of their general. Now, are these soldiers able to fight by themselves? Absolutely. Are these soldiers competent themselves? Absolutely. Are these soldiers powerful themselves? Absolutely. Do many of them have some of the skill sets that they could be general to? Absolutely. But the but that's not the assignment at the time. The battalion comes into alignment with the general because the general is looking out in the distance and the general has the battle strategy for leading and for going forward. And so not because they are weak, but because they have strength under control that they align themselves with the direction that is given by the general. And that's the way it is in the home. So husbands always understand this, that you aren't uh, wives don't submit to, to us based on mean-spiritedness, based on force, but it is a submission based on choice. Did you see the difference there? Submission doesn't come based on force. It comes based on choice. Now, when that choice comes, we need to make sure that there is leadership that is given. And uh, understand this, that many times that uh, it is difficult uh, for wives to submit 
to someone who's not leading and someone who has no clear direction on where we're going. That's why you uh, understand in this scripture that uh, we, when you think about having a wife, you need to first figure out, do you have a clear direction? Do you have a clear view of where you're trying to lead her spiritually? Do you have a direction of where you're trying to lead her uh, financially and, and in the management and in the care for the home and in the discipleship of the children? Do you have direction and clarity on where you're going? Because it's hard for somebody to follow when you don't know where you're going. And so this is what this uh, scripture is teaching us. Christ has clarity on what he wants for the church. That's why the church can follow and fall in line alignment with Christ. And so uh, husbands ought to have clarity on where we're going. So wives can fall in alignment in submission to uh, where we're going. So as Christ is the head of the church. Now, let me also say one last thing that that's uh, the, one of the other challenges that we have in our modern culture. And that is that, uh, uh, we have uh, feminist conflict theory, also egalitarianism, uh, which says that, that, uh, that we're all on the same plane. But at some point, somebody has to lead. Understand that the church will never uh, give leadership to Christ, but Christ always gives leadership to the church. And so we got to be clear about that uh, based on the scriptures. Uh, then it says he is the head of the church, but then he is the savior of the body. He is the one that provides spiritual blessing for the body. Can I ask you, husbands, are you providing spiritual blessing uh, in your home? Are you providing spiritual direction and guidance and help in your family? Uh, because that's what the scripture says very clearly. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit themselves to their husbands in every uh, thing. And that means in all areas and not just the ones they pick and choose, but in the areas, uh, in, in all areas that there should be consistent leadership and consistent uh, support and submission. Then in verse 25, it says, husbands, now watch this, husbands love your wives just as, or in the same way, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So we see submission first, but submission we also see is uh, made better and it's made, uh, it's, it's made blessed and confirmed by the sacrifice, that's the second, sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that Christ can be head of the church is because he sacrificed for the church. Remember, I quoted Acts chapter 20, verse 28, uh, take heed therefore of yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, feed the church of God, which he has what? Purchased with his own blood. Christ sacrificed for the church and gave himself for the church. And so one of the things husbands we need to be clear about, and that is that our role and goal is to sacrifice of ourselves for our mate, for our spouse, that she should know very clearly that we are giving up of ourselves, giving up of our energy, giving up of our, our earthly possessions. Everything we have should be to her help, love, and support. Everything Christ had he gave for the blessing of the church. So much so that if you were to go to heaven right now and ask Christ, we need a little bit more based upon uh, uh, the things that are going on in the world. We need you to give more of yourself. Give more to the church. He'd empty out his pockets, pockets uh, turned inside out and say, I don't have anything else to give. Uh, it, when it came down to it, 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 his hands were given to the nails. When it came down to it, his head was given to the thorn uh, the thorny crown. His side was given to the spear. His feet were given to uh, the rivets. Christ gave all for the church. And as husbands, guess what? It's our privilege. It's our blessing to give all of ourselves in sacrifice for the one whom we love. You know, one of the things about love, love will cause you to sacrifice. And there are too many people in our modern culture that approach. And the reason that divorce uh, happens many times is because too many people approach marriage from a selfish standpoint of looking what I can get out. But husbands, understand this. Even when you feel like you're not getting as much as you're giving, always remember this, Christ gave all and he gave of himself completely. It is our role not to take, but it is our role to lay down gladly all that we have for the care, love and support. And if we're approaching marriage from a selfish standpoint, we can never be happy 
because we're always going to want more because of the, the, the pride of life and the, and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. So if we're not getting what we want, then we look and see how can I go somewhere else and get this? How can I go this and go there and get this? But honestly, sacrifice is built into the job description of being a husband, that we give all that we have for the blessing and for the demonstration of love for the wife that God has blessed us with. Can you imagine the joy that Adam felt after having been alone all of that time? We don't know how long it was since the time that God made him and placed him in the garden to the time that God laid him down and per performed the first operation and took from him the rib. We don't know the time period of how long Adam lived, but we do, do know this, that God presented to him a blessing when he presented Eve. And friend, can I tell you this? Whenever God does bless you, if you're not married, when God does bless you to find a wife and he that finds a wife finds a good thing, you ought to be willing to honor God by honoring her in sacrificing whatever you can for her blessing and for her comfort and for her care, just as Christ does for us. And so there is sacrifice uh, that is seen in the text. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Here Christ sanctifies the church. Christ uh, is, is present for the spiritual blessing and benefit of the church. Husbands, can I ask you this question? Are your wives blessed because of you? Are your wives uh, helped spiritually because of you? How often are you praying for your wife? How often are you sharing and helping, uh, trying to, to disciple with her and trying to grow in Christ and grow in your love for God with her? Because that's a part of the job description as well. Uh, we sacrifice of ourselves in that way uh, uh, to, to her help and benefit. Verse 27 said, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. And so he, again, he's spiritually a benefit, blessing and help to his bride. And that's where you and I should be. We should be a spiritual benefit, blessing and help to our bride. Then verse 29, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives. L listen at what Paul says, husbands, are to love their wives uh, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. One of the things about sacrifice is we ought to sacrifice as much as we can in a demonstration of love, not just obligation. Yes, we have an obligation. We have a God calling, a God duty, but also it should be a sacrifice of love. It ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful and glad that God has given us uh, help me that whom we can love and whom we can shower affection upon and, and, and to provide love and support to. It is a blessing. She is, let me be very clear. She is a blessing to you from God. In verse 28, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Uh, what does Paul mean here? It means that uh, whatever love you bestow upon her, it's, it's just a mirror that is shining back and reflecting on you. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does the church since we are members of his body. Just like you wouldn't hurt yourself, just as you wouldn't take a blunt object and, and beat on yourself and hurt yourself, so you shouldn't want to do that uh, to your wife, not with your words, nor with your uh, in physical uh, standpoint either. That uh, just as you care for yourself, so you should care for your wife. You should still be opening doors. You should still pull out chairs. You should still speak with respect, kindness, and love. S she submits, you serve, and sacrifice. And then number three, number three, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a mystery. It's profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself and the wife is to respect her husband. He says, I'm speaking a mystery about Christ and the church. Here's one of the things I want to leave with you. So we saw submission, we saw uh, sacrifice, but third, it's symbolic. The relationship between a husband and wife is a symbol of Christ's love with the church. That's an everlasting love. That's a sacrificial love. That's a love of submission where the church submits to Christ. And so when we are married, it's more than just about the two of you. It's about showing a picture of Christ's relationship with his bride 
the church. Every time a young couple gets married, it's symbolically representing Christ's union with his church. When, when children grow up and they see a loving relationship between husbands and wives, it demonstrates that bond and that union that Christ has with the church. And everything about our lives, every part of our lives as Christians should always be pointing towards Christ and to his honor and his glory. May I ask you, friend, does your marriage glorify and honor Christ? Is it symbolic of the great union that Christ has with his church? Because that's what we need to have in view. So many people talk about, uh, well, I'm not happy or uh, I don't feel the same anymore. You've changed and I've changed and all of these things. Listen, listen. When you recognize the assignment and the assignment for marriage is more than just feeling. The assignment is to give Christ honor so that when wives submit themselves to their husbands, he says, do it as unto Christ. You know what he's saying? Do it in honor of Christ so that he will see Christ in you and that others will see Christ in you. When he talks about husbands sacrificing themselves for their wives so that when there's a bump in the night, uh, you don't send her out and say, hey, go see what that is. No, you get up and you go see what it is. When, it, when the bullets start flying, you, you stand in front and to protect her. That's what sacrifice means. It means that I'm going to take the harm and the hurt because I want you to be all right. Hey, isn't that what Christ does for us? That he takes and bears so many of our burdens because he loves and cares for us. All of these things are symbolic representations of Christ's love for the church. And that's why, that's why divorce is so detrimental. It's because it breaks that great view and that picture of Christ in his church. I pray this has helped. Uh, we'll take a deep dive another time into this matter. There's been many questions that we have had, and so I'll answer many of them in successive uh, teachings later. And if there's enough uh, interest, uh, also remember that you can join the Knot Fellowship led by Brother Albert and Sister Ora White. Listen, I love you all dearly. God bless you. We'll continue to walk in victory.